Good morning, everyone. Welcome again to our series number five, Gender and Domestic Violence During the COVID-19 Global Pandemic. Um, again, please um, thank you for joining us this uh, morning or um, wherever you are. Please let us know who you are and uh, where you're signing from uh, by using the, the chat um, on, your, on your screen. Uh, without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to our CEO, Dr. Frank Aswan. Thank you very much, Toyin, and uh, welcome everyone. Once again, as Toyin has mentioned, this is a 15th in our series of these uh, webinars that we're running in partnership uh, between AVP and Suncalp. And uh, the focus has been throughout the series to look at how is, uh, how is Africa's most vulnerable uh, population, people living in informal settlements, uh, rural areas and other kind of vulnerable uh, places in our societies coping with COVID-19. And we've been through uh, topics around education, we've been through food security, we've been through the informal settlement. And if you need to uh, find the previous uh, videos and previous webinars, please uh, feel to go to either the Suncup um, YouTube channel or the AVP YouTube channel and you should be able to find everything there. But thank you, please enjoy this session. Um, uh, you've got some interesting speakers coming through. I do want to apologize that one of our speakers, um, uh, Steve Petsike uh, from South Africa, to sadly pull out today because of this particular issue. Uh, she's dealing with a, uh, a domestic violence case. Uh, and so she's had to pull out of this session. Very unfortunate not to have a, a voice as part of this conversation. But we'll see how we'll bring her into this topic at some point in the near future. So I um, hope you all enjoy and uh, join back. Thank you, Frank. Um, so I see people from Africa. So just keep um, letting us know where you're coming from. And uh, thank you again for joining. My name is Toyin Adegite Moore. I'm the Executive Director of West Africa for um, African Venture Philanthropy Alliance, uh, co-sponsor of this um, series with Sankalp uh, Dialogue. So before we go into our first speaker, let's have our first poll, please. And we have 30 seconds. Um, to please complete the poll. And it says, what do you think has been the main reason behind the increase in gender and domestic violence during the COVID-19 pandemic? Okay. Welcome everyone, those that are joining. Please answer the poll and we will close the poll in another five seconds. Okay. Our poll shows that 45% um, interest in loss of income and uh, economic tension, and also household uh, power struggles. Partners who <laughs> um, now want influence on household decision causing tension. So interesting. It's, uh, um, the fever is very low on the, so two things uh, showing as high as whole, loss of income, and economic tension and full power struggle. All right, thank you very much. So now we're going to move on to the next speaker. Uh, next speaker is Homa Bibi, the Executive Director from um, Alliance for Africa. Uh, we'll have to do, I'll turn it over to Ihoma. Okay, good morning, everyone. Um, 
Are we ready? Okay, I'm, this morning I'm going to be talking about addressing gender stroke domestic violence in the informal settlements during the COVID-19 um, situation that we've had. Um, we're all experienced. Many of us have been at home locked down for almost six, seven weeks. Um, it's been a really emotionally draining situation. Um, and it has impacted our mental health um, in many, many ways that we never thought. So can I have the first slide, please? Can I have the next slide? Thank you. Um, Alliances for Africa works in the five southeastern states of Nigeria. Um, if you know what Nigeria is, we're a federated country, so there are 36 states. Um, the COVID-19 pandemic has highlighted that it has affected people differently. And in our work, that's what we're seeing, that people, um, men and girls, uh, single women, single men, um, the elderly, disabled, have experienced it completely, completely differently. And then those in an income bracket that they can afford to social distance have a different experience to the lockdown um, process than those who are in settlements or in what we call in Nigeria, face me, I face you, uh, shanty towns. So their experiences are completely different. And bear in mind, some of the demands as requested by the NC, uh, the National Center for Disease Control, which includes distancing, which includes washing hands, which includes wearing face masks, all come with them a certain assumption lifestyle. So for those informal supplements, they have challenges with the lack of existing washed facilities water, sanitation, hygiene. These are not in existence. There is no born water in a shanty town. You go to a well and you fetch water or you have somewhere where someone has dug a borehole and you fetch water and you take it to your shack. So those in those situations have experienced the lockdown differently. Can I have the next slide, please? And so the reality is that Nigeria, like everywhere else, uh, the emerging data through the media, through social media, through traditional media, uh, have demonstrated that since the outbreak of COVID-19, violence against women and girls, and particularly intimate, viol uh, intimate partner violence has intensified. And so we're getting reports uh, remember, schools were safe havens for young girls, particularly if they lived in these kinds of places. So school was a place to go to in between the hours of where at least you're safe to a certain degree. Those girls are now at home. And so Nigeria is no different to other countries and civil society organizations scramble the late data to demonstrate the seriousness of the problem, the federal government. Now, federal government, in, by, in putting together a presidential task force, um, there are no women on it. And so we've had to battle and lobby uh, using different informal and informal channels to negotiate for sexual and gender-based violence service providers to be declared as essential, essential services, allowing them to move around unencumbered during the lockdown period. Because what we were seeing was that women were calling hotlines, but service providers couldn't get to them to move them because the police and the military were on the streets. Now, the impact of this are that they're being, you know, it's being further compounded by lockdown measures that are unintentionally creating 
stressful and precarious living environments for women and girls, especially those in informal settlements, urban and rural poor communities. And we make assumptions about some of these requests. These informal settlements have no access to water. They, they are all camped in one room. And if you're lucky, you may have what they call room and palo, or a small room where you've uh, cordoned off a section uh, as a sleeping quarters. They're not very conducive uh, for families, but many families live in these places. Um, additionally, increased exposure to COVID-19 has put women in the front line as carers to family. And so this has also been a problem. Um, how do you address it? How do you deal with it? Uh, prevention and treatment, but there are no PPEs for those at home. Can I have the next slide, please? Additionally, the lack of access to health care and sexual health and reproductive health services. Now, remember, many women are at home. Um, some women would be engaged in sexual intercourse in situations that are unconducive. And what do I mean? A few weeks ago, a, a video surfaced online and on WhatsApp here in Nigeria in which a man was chasing his wife around the compound of face me, I face you in one of these settlements in Lagos. They were speaking Yoruba. She came out in her wrapper. She had a bra on, she had a wrapper and she ran out of the house and someone was filming. And what was the problem? She complained in Yoruba that he was having too much sex with her. And that since the night before, he wanted more sex and she was tired and she was sore. Um, now there's been a reduction of vital services. Shelters have closed, courts have closed, social services all closed due to the lockdown and social distancing. Food and resource insecurity, there's not enough food coming because of the transport situation coming from the bread basket of Nigeria, Benue State and those states that are agriculturally inclined. The economic shocks put an added stress on those in vulnerable settlements, the urban and rural poor communities, many of whom are daily wage earners. And remember, it's not like they're earning a lot of money to be to, in the first place. So not having daily income is a major, major problem for violence to happen because you have children to feed and there's nothing else that can be done. Um, the exclusion from decision-making at a state level, the task force for COVID have not included women. At a federal level, it's, there are no female members and therefore the gendered experiences are not there. Um, neither have the task force of many states. So the gender lens is therefore very much missing in the planning and in the implementation of services to tackle COVID-19. Barriers to information. Uh, many women lack the, 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 especially in informal settlements, lack the ability to engage with the internet um, because of lack of education. And so they're relying on fake news and fake news is not the best. Uh, the last slide, please. Apologies if I'm rushing, I don't have many, many, many minutes left. So working with the ministry, what are we doing in Alliances for Africa? Working with the ministry in Imo State. Um, we have a hotline for victims of gender-based violence in Imo State. We've designed and shared with a sexual and gender-based violence network, uh, a data collection tool for clerking all calls to the hotline. We've provided uh, f uh, resources for community food banks for vulnerable communities. And finally, uh, we have radio jingles in local languages on COVID and we've taken the hashtag from the National Center for uh, Disease Control called Take Responsibility as the tagline. 
uh, we have a YouTube COVID-19 jingled as well. That's all. I'm sorry if I'm rushing, but I can see uh, being told to wrap up your comments quickly, please. Thank you very much, um, Ioma, for, for that, um, um, for, for letting us know what's going on in Nigeria and especially what your organization alliances uh, for Africa is trying to do around uh, gender and domestic violence. Um, we're going to have questions fielded um, after the next speaker. And before that, we will um, also have a second poll, uh, please. And, and please keep letting us know what you're thinking. Let us know where you're coming from um, in the chat box as well so that we know who's joining us. Um, again, welcome everyone um, who's joining us right now. We're now on to our poll question number two. What do you think is the best way to reduce the increase in cases of gender and domestic violence during the COVID-19 pandemic? We'll have another 40 seconds and then we'll get our results. Okay, let's have the results, please. Okay, so it's, um, again, huh, looks like we have another close, close um, poll between two, two answers here. Providing better formal reporting structures and assistance for people affected by GBV um, and enabling need-based movement in spite of lockdowns. So those are the two areas in terms of what are the best ways to reduce um, the incidence. So thank you. Without um, further ado, I'm going to move on to the next speaker. Um, so keep telling us what you think and please have your questions um, again ready so that after our next speaker, we can um, go into questions. Um, next speaker is Beatrice, and she is a legal analyst, and she's from, um, sorry, uh, a lawyer, who's from the Center for Rights, um, Education and Awareness. Uh, Beatrice. Thank you, Toyin. Good morning, everyone. Uh, I must thank Ilioma for setting the context so very well. I must say I'm not surprised at how much the situation is not, the situation in Nigeria is not any different from the situation in Kenya. The struggles are the very same ones that the, uh, the urban poor, especially in informal settlements, are facing in Kenya, including even the rural poor. So uh, I will not belabor the point by repeating the context on what she has said. Uh, crew is the Center for Rights, Education and Awareness is a feminist human rights organization. We champion the rights of women in Kenya. We are in more than nine counties, which probably would be the equivalent of federal states elsewhere. Uh, we are in nine counties in Kenya, and we work around four thematic areas, which is ending violence against women and girls, elimination of economic and social cultural discrimination, promoting the effective participation of women and girls, and promoting their access to comprehensive sexual and reproductive health and rights. Um, so in this COVID situation, what has been thrust for is, and what we have probably scaled down our operations and narrowed down to is the ending violence against women and girls. Next slide, please. So given the context that Ilioma said and that our challenges are the same, what we have had to do as an organization is 
quickly tap into the human the human rights champions, human rights defenders, and community champions that we have trained, who are now the first responders to gender-based violence survivors, to link them with service providers. The champions, the community champions, are people who live within the communities, are, are usually doing their own work, but have had the call of social justice and are committed to doing their own small acts to uh, champion gender justice at their level. So this is who we have had to have a robust engagement with because they're the ones in close proximity in this time of uh, limited movement. So what they do is uh, get into contact with survivors, probably take them either to a police station, to a medical facility, or to anywhere else they can access um, services because the movement of uh, other staff in the office is much limited. Uh, you will find that one of the challenges that we have had is police turning away uh, victims of domestic violence, asking them to go and resolve their disputes at home. And this is driven by uh, many factors because uh, there is an exercise to decongest prisons and uh, other detention facilities. So perpetrators are coming back home and they are threatening victims. So the champions are carrying out both prevention and response messaging. We have various ways of using that. That's, for example, using megaphones where they go around the community, speaking into a big megaphone, preaching the uh, message of prevention and response to gender-based violence. They also conduct a few mediation activities uh, within couples who are having uh, challenges in their relationships. We are also equip them with reflector jackets together with the basic uh, pro protective equipment that we are able to provide. So the reflector jackets contain all the telephone numbers that people can call for response on GBV. We have also had to incorporate drawing of murals. These are artistic um, messaging that is drawn on walls that are in the communities. They have gender-based violence messaging. They also have COVID response messaging, and they all they have contact information for most of the service providers who are reporting to GPV. As an office, we have had to increase the telephone lines to serve people, uh, especially with calls, many, many more calls uh, for requesting for psychosocial support. We have had to increase uh, the lines for tele counseling in order to continue to serve our beneficiaries. And just last week, we have had to reopen the office at least once a week because we were getting very many cases reported to us. Within a month, we had more than 55 cases, and those are the only ones uh, I, I am only reporting about what has been uh, reported to crew. There were many, there must be very many other unreported cases. So 55 cases in under a month was too much, and we thought of reopening the office at least once a week. We were, uh, to serve our clients within the precautionary measures. We have had to collaborate and forge partnerships with duty bearers and other stakeholders uh, because this work is very hard to do alone. Uh, the prevalence of GBV is uh, very difficult. We have had to gather together as women rights organization and put an advisory note to the government in uh, giving certain asks because it's the same situation as Nigeria. The national response team in Kenya uh, is barely paying attention to gender-based violence, has, has not included the participation of the civil society or women rights or people for, from vulnerable groups. So we have had to do an advisory note to the government, uh, asking them various things that they need to put in place in order to respond to gender-based violence. And we have had also to collaborate to collate the uh, and document the various human rights situations that are going on because very many other human rights situations are being violated and just pull together resources, whichever uh, partner has a toll free line, but they get a gender based violence related case, they're able to quickly put that to us and we are able to respond. We have also tried to link vulnerable women and households to government cash transfer programs. Uh, 
and to provide them with basic uh, protective equipment. However, the cash transfers have not been very um, effective. We still have not, the list that we submitted to the government has not been um, given any attention as it is. Um, next slide, please. So we are still struggling with that. Um, as I go to the lessons learned, we have been trying to document uh, all the lessons that we are learning in all the cases. We have had to quickly adapt our programs and have conversations with our funders to put in place response mechanisms at a faster pace. And we are engaging the state as I talked about, and we are documenting all the learnings and probably engaging with research for evidence-based learning. Next slide, please. So as I conclude what we are struggling with as an organization, of course, this situation caught us off guard as it has caught everyone else. We are definitely short of money and it might sound cliche uh, as it is, but that's the situation. People imagine that civil society organizations have money, which is not the truth. And when it comes to adaptive programming, that is one of the greatest needs. So financial resources are constrained. We, if we were able to we would do cash transfers, even to our human rights champions, the community champions on the ground, because even for them, their small businesses have been shut down. Basically, the people in informal settlements are really, really struggling economically um, and so supporting the small scale businesses that exist within the informal settlement who have lost business is one of the ways which we see if people could um, come in to support and of course the provision of personal protective equipment as Ilioma said these people their priorities are the most uh, the first priority is food not even soap not sanitizer not a face mask so that is one of the things that uh, people are struggling with in sanitation facilities. So if we could get uh, uh, a way to have more funds to do that, and the menstrual hygiene packs that also contribute to the sexual and reproductive health of people, we realize that people uh, are now having unsafe sex, especially girls who are at home, teenage girls, because they do not have money, their parents do not have money, so the must resort to other ways to cater for their menstrual hygiene. Um, I'll stop there in the interest of time. Thank you, teachers, um, again for that for that um, uh, walkthrough in terms of what's going on <clears throat> in um, Kenya and um, what you're seeing. And as you mentioned, um, you know the context in Nigeria and in Kenya are very similar in that sense. And, and I think all of us would agree that this um, pandemic has really um, showed all the worst things uh, and exacerbated all the social issues and gender and um, gender violence <clears throat> is, um, is definitely uh, one of them as well that has really kind of brought to the fore the Im importance of um, what we all need to do to support uh, vulnerable communities and, and uh, women and girls. And um, without, uh, you know, spending too much time, please, um, again, continue to put your questions in the chat box. Uh, tell us what you uh, think. Tell us what you want to know uh, more about in terms of this, um, on, on this issue. And we will fill the questions to our, to our speakers. But before that, um, I hope Wendy from Oxfam is in the, in the house with us today. Um, I would like to call on Wendy to kind of, um, to give us some insights um, and respond to um, uh, what the speakers have shared this morning. Um, Wendy, are you in the, in the house? Hello. Margaret. Is Wendy in? Okay. Wendy, go ahead. Go ahead, Wendy. Hello. Um, so I, I'll not I'll not be speaking on behalf of Oxfam. Um uh because I, I don't uh, I no longer work with Oxfam, but um I do work with um 
various organizations and particularly with women um, smallholders in agriculture. We work in the, we work with private sector to try and see how private sector can invest more in gender equality. And one of the challenges that we are already seeing um, with women in this context is how um, with, uh, with COVID-19, there's been increased precarity for women, particularly because um, now they, um, you know, they, they're not engaged in their day-to-day -day businesses and their day-to-day -day earning. We know that um, gender-based violence is also as a result of um, um, an equal, um, you know, when women are not financially empowered, then their voices are, 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 are their voices reduced um, in the family household. And that really puts them in a much more precarious position economically um, and also just um, in terms of how they can negotiate their own uh, body autonomy in the households. So we've seen sort of this increasing and um, the challenge for us is um, how to work around that, particularly with the restrictions that we are facing um, uh, in the country uh, currently. Thank you very much, Wendy, um, for that um, remark. Um, so at this point, we'd like to um, field some questions from the audience. So if you can please, again, um, send your questions in so we can ask our speakers. For those that are joining, we've just had uh, two great speakers um, on this uh, topic um, of gender and um, gender violence in, you know, during this COVID-19 um, pandemic. Toyin, I think Lindsay fielded the first question um, around how women can safely access a hotline. That, that question came in very early on. Just wanted to make sure it didn't get lost. All right. So maybe we can start, uh, speakers, any one of you could answer that, please. How can women um, access the hotline during this time? Um, okay, I'll start with Nigeria. Um, first of all, we are, uh, you, as you know, Nigeria is a federated country. There are 36 states. Each state, the f we have federal laws, and then we have laws that are domesticated at state level. And that's where the problem starts, because Lagos State is one of the few states that has a violence, that has domesticated the federal law, the Violence Against Persons Prohibition Act. So in Lagos State, you have a hotline, you have a domestic violence respond unit team, you have the public defender's office. There's a system in place in which the law has been updated to take on board sexual and gender-based violence. And at a policy level, Lagos State has a no, a zero tolerance to violence. And that's where the problem is for other states who don't have a violence against persons a pro prohibition um, act because they haven't domesticated it at state level. Um, any services that are being uh, provided are provided by non nonprofits. I'll give this example of the state where our offices are based in Imo State. The state government does not have a hotline for domestic violence. We don't have a shelter. We don't even have services for rape victims. The services are being provided by the churches and the nonprofits. And that is a big, big problem because it means now between the, the last six weeks when the COVID-19 lockdown started, as of this morning, because I had to get the figures, we have had 38 incidents. And the worst part, there's a lot of negotiation between the families of the raped minors and the perpetrators who don't want to, and it's the police mediating. So the police themselves have forgotten their rules. Uh, 
Okay, if I may answer with to Please, safe access of okay. Sorry. Question. Go ahead, Vitri. Uh, so the situation is just the same the way Idioma put it, but what we have had to do, as I said earlier, is to put in more lines where people are able to access us, partner with more organizations to create more hotlines. And the way we are publishing this is putting them on social media posts, whether it's Facebook, whether it's uh, Twitter. We have also gone ahead to create physical posters, which are put in common areas where people access services. So for example, if it's a tank where people are washing hands, if it's a shop where they do money transactions or buy their basic food, still utilize our community champions to go around pasting their posters or where they can access the toll-free lines. We have a national gender-based violence toll-free line that has been publicized over time. And uh, what we realized at some point was that the toll-free line was not working that night. You would call and no one would answer. Again, it's the situation where there are no essential service providers to provide the services at night. So we had to have a conversation with the government and uh, at least now they are putting in place people to respond. But basically it's to increase uh, the toll-free lines and, and then see how that is and publishing it uh, the same way and in various platforms. Thank you. Um, the a lot of questions come in, so that's great. We'll do our best to, to address um, as many of them as possible. We, we tried, um, and as you can see, I mean, when you talk about gender, um, um, and we need to also include our men in the conversation and our boys. So there's a question um, from Nancy that says, how do we address um, GVV through education of men and boys? Okay, if I could pick it as if you have passed, what we have been doing is um, in the GBV awareness and response messaging that our community champions uh, are going out with, what we are encouraging and what we have been doing for a long time as an organization is encouraging couples to have healthy relationship and positive conversations. Because for example, the economic tension is within many households. How are we able to have discussions around money uh, so that it does not escalate to the point of violence? How are we able to talk about household chores who should do what, at what point, we should take care of the children, combining different parenting styles at different times, encouraging people to have healthy conversations and even involving them in some of the mediation services to help couples resolve their conflict. We all we actually have very many men who are converted and now are champions. Some are former perpetrators, some are people who have totally seen the message of gender justice and are the ones who are actually driving these conversations. You realize men will find a way of gathering at some point, even during this lockdown period, they might gather for a few minutes at shopping centers to release their tensions. But that is one of the drivers um, of gender-based violence. The release avenues are not there. Men gather probably in bars. Women will go to various stable banking, uh, facilities and groups where they are able to discuss and navigate various situations. So it's just spreading positive messaging uh, which between companies. So. And so for us in Alliances for Africa, we partner with others who work with men and young boys. And remember, part of the problem that we are experiencing is a lack of adequate sexual health education on issues around consent and behavioral patterns. And so young men grow into adult men who don't actually understand the dynamics of violence and how it affects women. And so for us, we've had to do jingles targeted at men and the programs that they, and air them on the programs that they listen to. We've had to work with partners in designing and engaging them in the, the most appropriate way that they understand. And sometimes it means meeting them at the, at the, at the point, um, which is uncomfortable, but negotiating with them through uh, some of the male uh, gatekeepers. 
and the male associations. Um, Imo State is predominantly uh, Igbo community speaking Igbo the language. And so we've had to revert to using dialect to transmit a lot of these messages. But at the end of the day, we still have a problem with our sexual health and reproductive health education because it's not adequate at a secondary school level uh, and does not provide the skills that young people need as they grow into adults to negotiate safely with, in these relationships. Um, uh, uh, you know, because the, the COVID pandemic has also shown an increase in young men under the age of 18 raping other minors, three years, four years, five years and below. So clearly we have a pandemic and a problem on, on, on sexual behavior. Another question um, around that links to our poll, um, that if we have a, um, if, if there's issues around uh, lifestyle and the fact that people are now in confined uh, spaces and that's why there's um, also an increase in, in tension. You know, are there any other alternative income generation opportunities um, so that the cases arising from the economic tension can be curbed? And this is from Nick. Nikate, Nikarika. Well, I must say that the economic opportunities for the urban poor and even the rural poor are very limited because these are people who rely on small scale businesses. You will realize some women who have probably gone beyond uh, were probably doing beadwork, some artwork. ETC. Right now, people do not have money to spend on luxuries. What they prioritize is uh, basic needs, food, clothing, shelter. Even clothing is not so much of a priority right now. So the economic opportunities are very limited. As a stopgap measure, probably cash transfers might have to come in, um, led by the state or the government as we continue to think around, because these are not people like you and I who are able to quickly transfer our other skills and abilities. They are struggling with literacy. So for example, not even just uh, digital literacy, but basic literacy, they do not know how to read and write. They do not have access to telephone services. They're not able to translate their other skills or market their other items elsewhere. So it is, uh, quite a challenge, but uh, for me, I would see as a solution, for example, if there is uh, protective equipment, the face masks, the soaps that are being distributed, the government should prioritize uh, the urban poor who are able to make these things. We have very many women who are able to make soap using basic um, ingredients, provide them the basic ingredients and give them platforms to sell their soap buy the face masks from them on by bulk and then help them to produce more in other ways of, as we see other, which other ways we could go. Okay. Thank you very much for that response. Is, um, I, I don't want to call out anyone, but you know, if we have any, um, man in the room, any um, supporters, he for she's that are in the room, um, uh, in the house with us this morning, um, can you raise your hand and we'll call you to have quest for a question. Meanwhile, um, maybe while we wait for a man to ask a question, I'll also to another question for Beatrice here um, around um, children and safe havens for children. Um, what, what, are, what are some of the um, opportunities that are now pre um, presented in terms of um, where children can have a haven? Because as you know, schools, um, going to school, you know, for most, for some of the children in the vulnerable communities uh, is their safe haven. And now that we're um, 
there, there's no school to go to. They're now in the house where they're being abused. So what, what, what can we do to support children in, um, and create and have a, this opportunity for a safe, ha safe haven for them? Features. Okay, so this is a very sticky issue for us, even as an organization, because uh, the children's services have, have scaled down their operations. The shelters that take even children are full to capacity, and they're also afraid of congestion. What we have seen sometimes is children being put in health facilities. Um, as a measure of rescue because we also do not have government owned shelters and safe houses it's it's very very the situation is really really bad because uh as i said perpetrators when they are arraigned in court and i will tie this to the question of legal protection the legal uh, channels and access to justice are gone totally digital so you realize the informal poor in people in informal settlements, the urban poor, the rural poor, have totally been locked out of access to justice. They've been totally left behind. So what happens is when the perpetrators are arraigned in court, they're given very small uh, bill terms, which they are able to quickly pay and go back into the community. When they go back to the community, they go back to intimidate their witnesses, the victims, and in any relatives and community members who might be around, and probably even to commit more crimes. So the challenge and my proposal to the solution would be, if the government can find quarantine facilities for sick people, they sure can find facilities to put in these perpetrators. Because one of the challenges we've always had is to remove the victim rather than the perpetrator. So we keep placing the burden on the victim. So, uh, so if, for example, you're removing the child from that home, there are other children left in those homes. And traditionally, um, or rather not traditionally, in the past, what people usually used to do is send their children to boarding school or a country um, in the rural areas. Those who are living in towns send their children in the rural areas for some measure of protection. With the movement restriction, that cannot happen. So my proposal, and I wish the government would take this up, is to find a facility where they can confine all these perpetrators together as we wait for the COVID situation to resolve. Then they can continue carrying out behavior change, conversations, counseling, and support as they wait for the legal process to take its course. Let's remove the perpetrators from the victims. Let's not destabilize victims. Because if, for example, it is a father who has beaten the mother, um, if you take the mother to a safe space, who is left to cater for the children? And most of the childcare work is for women. So let's not continue re-victimizing victims. OK. Thank you very much, uh, Beatrice. Um, let's hear from a uh, uh, male perspective on, on all these issues and all the insights that have been uh, discussed so far. So, Arif, are you, um, are you on? Yes, I'm here. Can you hear me clearly? Yes, I'm here. Can you hear me clearly? Loud and clear, Arif. Good, yes, okay, great. On. Yeah, okay, so thank you very much. So it's been a very stimulating um, um, conversation. So my name is Arif Zaman. I'm, I sit on the board of the Commonwealth Women's um, Commonwealth Business Women's Network. Um, so we're a, what's called an accredited organization. What that means is we have direct recognition from the 54 Commonwealth governments. Um, and we've been very much, um, um, you know, very engaged on the Commonwealth COVID response. And I think in response to what I've been hearing and also the Commonwealth conversations, I think it's been, um, what's the right word to use? I think it's been a little, I think it's been a bit disappointing, I think I would say actually, because there was a, the, the, there hasn't been really sufficient recognition of two or three things. And I'm really reflecting back what I've heard in relation to the, the Commonwealth countries. Um, one is, um, women's voices, I think, are not necessarily heard enough or as loudly. Um, secondly, there's been very little linkage between the four Commonwealth priorities. So violence against women, addressing violence against women is absolutely one of the four Commonwealth priorities, as is um, 
women and climate change, women in leadership and women's economic empowerment. Now, we all know that these things are interlinked. And actually, you know, there has been very little attempt to, to link um, the impact of, you know, violence against women, you know, with some of these other areas. Um, I, I think it is important also for, um, for business women to be, you know, engaged in this process. So I think I would, what I would say to you is I think what, what you're doing is really important. I think in, in creating more awareness and visibility for this. I think it's also um, important to recognize, um, you know, I think there was a World Bank report that also thought about this recently, the patriarchal norms, economic uncertainty and stress, all of these combined with, with confinement measures and disruptions and services, as, as other colleagues were saying on the call and your other speakers have already triggered disturbing increases in domestic violence. Um, and we really need to, um, you know, um, ensure that in the policy response, this is absolutely, you know, built in at the core. Um, I'm not convinced it is in every Commonwealth country. And we need to ensure that we do that. And one way to do that, frankly, is through collaboration in civil society. So I would, you know, call out and reach out to anybody who's on this call from a Commonwealth country. If they'd like to, um, you know, work with us in this endeavor, I'd be happy to facilitate that and to see what we could do. Thank you. Fantastic. Thank you, Arif. Um, one other, um, some other questions, and, and I know that our time is, is going, but um, you know, there's just so many very good questions and issues around gender violence that we, we are yet to explore. But another question from Eunice here, have you come across any um, gender violence um, perpetrated by women, you know, and how easy is it for men to come forward to report um, domestic violence? So Beatrice, please. Okay. Um... Oh, I think. You're welcome. Yes, yeah, sorry. Mm -hmm. I, I, I just think that there's a gender in itself and the violence against both are there. It's just that the percentages are different. So we do have young men who have been victims of sexual and gender based violence. And what do I mean? Many households in Nigeria have an auntie or a nanny. We have situations in which these young women take advantages of the minors in their care that are boys. But we also have other situations of violence against young boys where adult men sodomize these young boys. But the percentages are very, very, very minute. And the reporting mechanisms for those young men are not as robust as they are for the women. The reality is a lot of these boys by 16, 17, 18, think it's cool to be sexually active. And it's not until they're in their twenties that they recognize that they've been a victim of sexual assault. By then it's causing them other problems. Not many men come to publicly report that their wives batter them because it is so few and so far between, you know, and it's also not something they want to publicly acknowledge that they are victims of domestic violence. That doesn't mean it's not there. It just means the percentages are very, very, very slim. And therefore the structures in place for reporting are not as good. Um, it's still uh, seen as a slap and a tickle and, you know, it's still considered, uh, you know, you got your manhood kind of thing, you're Jack the Lad, ha, 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 ha. And it's not considered um, as important as it should be. It doesn't mean it's not happening. It's just not given the importance. Thank you for that comment. In the interest of time, we have uh, five more minutes, but if people are interested, we will write at uh, 10 o'clock, uh, we'll continue the conversation. And those that can stay on will stay on and those that need to leave, we understand. Uh, but um, maybe what we'll do is, is um, wrap up at exactly 10 and then um, continue in terms of the conversation since there are a lot of questions that are coming up 
um, around this issue. Um, one of the issues, um, questions before Ihoma and um, Beatrice, if they need to leave, um, uh, is um, around awareness. And what, what are we doing, what can we do to ensure that this, um, what your, both your organizations are trying to do right now during COVID will continue even post COVID in terms of engagement with government, engagement with uh, civil society, engagement um, in terms of awareness and uh, communication uh, and the importance of people uh, understanding um, what they need to do, what are some of the behavioral changes, um, um, options that people have in terms of uh, where to go. So I'll turn it over to the two speakers. So going forward, um, awareness needs to continue. We did not start, as an organization, we did not start um, awareness raising in the time of COVID. This is something we have done for the last 20 years. And I believe it had been done even by other organizations and parties even before then. So we, now that COVID has brought forth uh, the challenges of gender-based violence and the drivers that exacerbate the situation, it's for us as a society to continue having these conversations within ourselves. Do, um, how can we go around the patriarchal norms that we have had? How can we have conversations around toxic masculinity? How can we have conversations around positive, healthy, um, intimate partner relationships where power is balanced? How can we continue having these conversations beyond COVID? Because COVID is just as top, um, is just something that has shaken us to the core and brought forth all the vulnerabilities that we have tried to hide. And as I was saying in the chat box, it is time that the government prioritized this conversation and really took it up to continue driving it. I wish even the mainstream media could take up these um, challenges in their messaging and give slots as part of the contribution to the society because one of the avenues we have been trying to use as an organization is community radio shows where we have speakers go into various uh, community radio shows and speak in the language that people most understand the message of around gender-based violence and asking people uh, to have better relationships in the houses and perpetrators to stop just perpetrating uh, the violence, to stop being aggressors, to stop um, the sexual violence. So, and if you really think as a perpetrator, it's something that you can't help within yourself, there is a channel to seek um, other behavioral change. There are channels where you could be taught around how to manage whatever it is that you're struggling with without having to resort to violence. So the awareness messaging must continue or beyond COVID. Yes, I mean, I think I would like to reiterate what Beatrice has said without reinventing the wheel. I think awareness has to continue. I think unfortunately or fortunately, the COVID-19 pandemic has highlighted the, the, the major fault lines within patriarchy and its encouragement of toxic masculinity and how those have seeped, seeped into popular culture as almost an acceptable way of behaving towards women or minority groups. And so we have a situation in which popular culture has to be checked as well because some of these behaviors are perpetuated by Bollywood, by Nollywood uh, the film industry in Ghana, the music videos, uh, and with the lack of adequate sexual health education to emphasize certain behavioral responsibilities. Popular culture is the next best thing that young people use as they become young adults uh, and uh, as they take on the responsibilities of adult life. So I think awareness raising has to be constant. There has to be a responsibility uh, of the local media and traditional institutions and gatekeepers also have to be involved in, in, in pointing fingers and in showing an alternative way of treating women 
and in engaging in nonviolent behavior. Because right now it's not working, it's crazy. I mean, the numbers are staggering in certain states in Nigeria. And I think the, most, the scariest part are, are, are the unmitigated rape of under 18s, both girls and boys, ranging from zero months, you know, from two, three months old to the ones that are 18. It's just a nightmare. Uh, and we have to do something about it. Thank you. Thank you very much for um, that. I think it's, it's 10 of, well, it's, it's time, we're all in different time zones, but it's 10 o'clock Nigeria time, and I know Ioma needs to leave to go to another meeting. So thank you very much for everything that you've um, done and con contributed um, to our session this morning. And thank you for your work in the communities and across the different states that Alliance for Africa is, is um, currently working. And um, so just wanted to, to thank you. And at this point, um, I will turn it over to um, our CEO again, Frank, um, to maybe close off the session. And then if there are others that, um, if we want to kind of continue this conversation, we also have a Twitter handle and Instagram and LinkedIn that we can continue to have these conversations um, even after you know today and, and moving forward so that we can really, again, look for opportunities um, for, to really kind of um, show up resources and support to eradicate as we're trying to um, cross COVID, we also need to cross some of our social ills, which is gender and violence, um, uh, gender violence, um, domestic violence. And that's very important that we continue to work together to um, address those moving forward. So, so, so Torin, thank you very much. And before everyone goes, uh, we, we we thought we'd keep with there's an option for us to keep the um, the session running for another ten minutes or so. So if people want to still continue engaging on the conversation, uh, Torin's work as a moderator is not finished yet. Uh, but we'd be very happy. And I think um, if you do feel you, we're gonna kind of make it an, an open mic for for everyone. So if you feel you've got a comment you need to make in the meantime, uh, just raise your hand and the someone will let you into the conversation. But I think uh, as, as people are kind of coming together with, with, uh, with uh, raising their hands, uh, just wanted to first of all, thank everyone for, for making for this session. We hope they're adding value to us. Let us also know, um, uh, you know, how we can enhance your knowledge and your connection. We're very deliberate in making sure that these are Pan-African so that we can learn from each other uh, across the continent. We face very similar problems. Uh, you know, an informal settlement in Lagos, Johannesburg, and uh, Nairobi, or Dar es Salaam, or Lusaka is pretty much one and the same place in many ways. Um, but uh, our surroundings are a bit different. So if there's anything we can learn and share and we can contribute to each other's uh, ability to offer solutions to people who are most predisposed to uh, the pandemic, uh, let's see how we can help you. So if, if, if anyone feels very strongly that they have questions that they want to answer, uh, or ask, sorry, uh, please feel free. And Beatrice is still on the line for another couple of minutes. And Toyin mm -hmm. is also still on to, to engage your questions. Others, Toyin, I think there must still be one or two other questions that Beatrice could, could engage with and, and answer in the meantime. But uh, feel free to leave at your leisure. Uh, but thank you so much. And once again, uh, thank you to uh, SunCup on behalf of AVPA for the collaboration in helping us uh, host this series. And please look out for the ones uh, yet to come and uh, you know, uh, stay in touch and follow up as Toyin has mentioned with conversations on Twitter and other social media platforms. But uh, back to you to Toyin. Thank you, Frank. So um, more questions at, at this point or, or even comments uh, now oh, that we- uh, Shade has her hand up. Uh, I'll unmute Shade. I think that's a woman. You are <laughs> unmuted. Please go ahead. It's Thank called you. Shade. <laughs> yeah, thank you very much. Yes, um, I actually sent in a question about, um, is there any uh, online training for police? Um, police have such a, an important role to play and um, we need champions amongst them. Um, I happen to know one in Nigeria who's even uh, won an international award and, and, and he has been 
quite fantastic. Um, we have had him speak to us in our Zonda Club meetings and um, he's always there if I call or if anybody calls and there's an issue, but we need more. And um, is there any training on gender-based violence for police anywhere in Africa? Um, now that we're doing everything online, we, we could put something together and, and um, you know, really for once, um, um, get it right. Because if people are not, if the police are not um, properly trained, um, we, we can't do much. Uh, they'll just send women back home to suffer. Um, and and, and that's, the, that's the truth. And as for men, there's also a group that um, I know in Nigeria of men that are working on this issue of gender-based violence and um, sensitizing other men. I'm sorry, if I, I can't remember the name of the group, but I will get it and I can pass it on to, um, to Toing. Thank you very much. So Beatrice, would you like to answer that question around training or for any, the- anyone on the call also, I mean, Beatrice, it would be great for your feedback, but if anyone on the call has seen any interventions like this, feel free to, to raise your hand. Thank you. Um, Shade, Shady? Shade. <laughs> Shade. Oh, quite an interesting name. Um, that is one of the areas we could uh, begin to think around. We have trained many police officers, but the previous challenge that we've been experiencing is the transfers because in Kenya, you will train a police officer because they're based on a certain police station and they're stationed at the gender desk. Then once you train them, they work for a certain amount of time, then they are transferred to another station, probably even in a rural area or in a town, and they are taken to the, for example, traffic department. So all that knowledge uh, just goes to waste. Online training is a very good initiative that we could consider, but again, uh, we have been doing it at a small scale. All, all these things depend on the goodwill of the government, because if uh, the National Police Service, for example, does not prioritize the need for training of their officers on gender-based violence. Is It will be a challenge for us to trickle it down. We'll probably be just having trainings for people who are interested just for the sake of interest, not for people who not change-driven. So we want to have wider impact, and that is a conversation that we can actually consider fronting to the National Police Service because we have the expertise to uh, create a platform for online learning. But again, they might tell you right now their priority is different. They have to enforce the curfew. They have to enforce restriction uh, of movement measures. They have to, I don't know, pay attention to other crimes. I, I mean, gender-based violence is always given the last priority in this country. It's the least prioritized and we need to shift and the shift needs to come from the top. But that's a very good recommendation that we could actually take up and consider. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Do we have any safe places for GBV survivors in, in society? Any, and that's from Faith. And then I think, Mercy, we can take your, your questions after that. Okay. I, I don't know what exactly she means by place because the situation of gender-based survivors in the society is very challenging. We are a society that needs to have conversations around gender-based violence because what we are used and prone to doing is to stigmatize and re-victimize the survivors even more. So one, there are no government shelters the very few shelters that are, that are there are run by either well-willing individuals or civil society organizations, and they cannot accommodate all the victims that are there. So generally, even as a society, we need to stop the culture of victim blaming, victim shaming, and all that we are doing to make uh, victims feel smaller, damage their self-esteem, and we traumatize them even more. We really need to have conversations on how we treat victims of gender-based violence in order to give them a place and a surviving chance in the community. Fantastic. Okay, so, so we will we'll just 
for everyone, and again, in the interest of time, want to make sure that um, we can um, end our conversation today at 1015 uh, Nigeria time, which is uh, 12, 12, 15, I think Nairobi time and 1115 South Africa time. I think I got it. Um, so so uh, we'll have uh, Mercy ask the next question and then we'll wrap up. Yeah, my question is around mediation. So is this as much as uh, an intervention to address this issue? And is there any virtual um, sites or organizations that are actually offering this? Because I'm a mediator and I've been wondering how to plug in because, you know, obviously we can't meet victims face to face. But is there a way we can back, uh, plug in virtually? Is there anybody using this method? Um, from what I know and from a conversation that I, I, I participated in, the judiciary in Kenya is continuing with court annex mediation. That's one of the avenues you could plug in. And I think various other mediators um, and mediation platforms are offering the virtual services. So mediation could really be a channel to resolve this but it might not work for the urban poor and the rural poor. Uh, you realize these are people who are struggling with basic literacy, digital literacy, and the priority right now is basically food and other items that are of basic necessity um, to get them to access phones, to access even internet is a challenge. So um, mediation, virtual mediation is a platform, but it could work for people who are slightly privileged. The people in informal settlements right now, it might be a very big challenge for them. So what we are trying to do is maybe to get uh, the community champions and to train them virtually, maybe support them with uh, data bundles to access internet, train them virtually a bit on how they can continue um, carrying out mediation, basic, basic mediation services at the household levels and at the community levels in the villages where they belong. But I do agree, virtual mediation is a platform that could work. Um, just maybe not in the informal settlements as it is, but as we continue to monitor the situation, maybe we could have thinking around the community social justice centers where the services could be carried out virtually. Thank you. We've now come to the official uh, webinar. So again, once again, I want to thank everybody. Um, uh, Sankalp, Ariel, uh, Frank, um, Nancy, um, Margaret, and, and George, who are behind the scenes. And of course, our wonderful speakers, Beatrice and Jerry and Ioma um, Obibi, um, for their wonderful insights and contributions. Next week, our uh, sixth um, topic would be access to healthcare for low income and informal uh, populations. So uh, please, um, you know, put it on your calendar in, in Nigeria, time zone, it's nine o'clock in, uh, you know, Kenya, it's, it's at um, 11 and um, in South Africa, it's at 10 um, every uh, Thursday. And uh, look forward again to seeing you um, at the next webinar. Thank you. Have a great rest of the day and let everyone stay safe and healthy. Thank you.